writing can be a lonely profession. Once a book or story exists, it can be a highly sociable thing. The author is interviewed about it, appears at events, and these days can always be available to talk to their readers online. But the period of creation is one of solitude. Just you and the page, alone in the process of finding the right words to put on it. In the late 1920s, one writer of detective fiction was feeling this aloneness acutely. Anthony Barclay had published several novels and was enjoying some success with them, as detective fiction surged in popularity during what we now call its golden age. But he was feeling the lack of colleagues with whom he could celebrate and commiserate over the minutiae of their shared occupation. So he invited some writers over for dinner. Eventually, they would call themselves the Detection Club. And that's what we're going to learn about today. Welcome to She Done It. I'm Caroline Crampton. For all the formality and ritual it adopted later, the Detection Club had quite casual origins. Well, the Detection Club was formed in 1930, but it sprang out of a series of dinners that Anthony Barclay had hosted from 1928 onwards at his home in Watford. This is Martin Edwards, the current president of the Detection Club and the author, most recently, of the novel Mortmain Hall. Over the years of his involvement with the club, he's made a study of its history and he published some of that research in his book, The Golden Age of Murder, which was a big inspiration for me when I was starting this podcast. In that book, Martin explains that it's actually quite difficult to pinpoint exactly when those early dinners at Barclay's house took place, or who was there, because naturally nobody kept a proper record. I mean, who does keep carefully filed lists of their dinner guests? However, we do still have access to some of Barclay's motivations at that time via his letters. His idea at that time was that detective novelists really didn't know each other socially at all. They were all working in isolation. And he thought it would be good to get together with fellow writers and talk about matters of mutual interest, whether it was real-life crimes of the day, whether it was uh, dealings with publishers or, or anything else. Although we don't know who exactly was there when, I think it's reasonable to guess that Barclay hosted various combinations of people who would become founding club members. So Ronald Knox, Dorothy L. Sayers, Agatha Christie, Freeman Wills Crofts, Margaret Cole and others. A good time was had by all, it seems. And the dinners um, were apparently a big success. And arising out of that success, he he felt that it would be a good idea to, to form a social club that would meet a number of times a year to have dinner and, and essentially just chat, chat into the night. And so the club was proposed. Dorothy L. Sayers was amongst those who was an enthusiastic supporter, and she became very much a prime mover but also Agatha Christie, Ronald Knox, and uh, a good many other leading lights of the day came on board. Once he had an idea in hand, Anthony Barclay was not slow to action. It was felt that a proper club should have a president, and that this should be someone eminent in the profession of crime writing. In early 1930, Barclay approached Arthur Conan Doyle to ask him to become the first president. But this was shortly before Conan Doyle died. He was unable to accept. So um, Barclay didn't waste much time in approaching uh, G.K. Chesterton, who did accept and became the first president of the Detection Club. Although Conan Doyle was sadly not able to be part of this new initiative because of ill health, it was fitting that he was Barclay's first choice for president. Back in the early 1900s, Conan Doyle had been part of something called the Crimes Club, a dining society made up of writers, lawyers, academics and others who shared a fascination with crime and the criminal mind. Fellow members included P.T. Woodhouse, Doyle's brother-in-law E.W. Hornung, the coroner Ingleby Oddie, the MP and novelist A.E.W. Mason and many more. Although Barclay's idea for the Detection Club was more narrowly focused on crime writing rather than criminology, 
there can be no doubt that he was inspired by this earlier group. The Detection Club's first president, the critic, theologian and author G.K. Chesterton, is probably best known in this context as the author of the Father Brown Mysteries. Like Conan Doyle, Chesterton was also fairly near to the end of his life when he became involved with the club. He died of heart failure in 1936. But for Barclay, Sayers and the rest of the new generation of crime writers, he represented a vital link with their late Victorian forebears, who had done so much to popularise the genre. With a president in place, Barclay began to invite fellow writers to become founding members. He had some strict ideas about who should be let in, it seems. The idea was that members would be people who wrote detective fiction of high calibre. They would uh, have produced at least two such books and they would be elected by secret ballot by the existing members. So it it was a a, a self-selecting elite, if you like. Thriller writers were not allowed in. The uh, theory was that the standards of detective fiction were to be elevated In practice, of course, many of the early members were people that Barclay had got to know during those early dinners. Dorothy L. Sayers was very involved in the initial organisation and became an enthusiastic founder member when the club began in earnest in 1930. As did Agatha Christie, husband and wife G.D.H. and Margaret Cole, Clements Dane, Robert Eustace and others. By the time a formal set of rules and a constitution was adopted by the club in 1932, 28 members had been elected. It went pretty well from the start, by all accounts. The club soon became quite well known and and very reputable because most of the major writers at the time became founder members. A set of rules and constitution that were drawn up in 1932. It really went from strength to strength. The popularity of crime fiction itself, coupled with the personal success of many of the members, assured the Detection Club a certain amount of publicity. And then there was also the brilliant brain of Dorothy L. Sayers, who had been working in advertising for a few years alongside her writing to help it along. For instance, as Martin explains in The Golden Age of Murder, when Arthur Conan Doyle died on the 7th of July 1930, Sayers saw the chance for a bit of press and quickly sent a card in tribute from the whole of the detection club. Ritual and rules were a key part of the club early on. I talked about this a bit more in the ninth episode of the podcast, The Rules, The club's constitution included a set of rules about who could join, how disagreements would be settled, and what kind of writing the club existed to encourage. The doctrine of fair play was crucial here too, with the first rule declaring that, quote, it is a demerit in a detective novel if the author does not play fair by the reader. This was an idea that had grown out of the puzzle craze after the First World War, and in a whodunit came to mean that the writer constructed the story in such a way that it was possible for the reader to work out the solution for themselves, no clues withheld. The rules also prohibited members who produced adventure stories or thrillers, or stories in which the detection is not a main interest. Anthony Barclay didn't bring together these writers so that they could write, necessarily. It really does seem that what he was intending was something in the style of the Crimes Club, a dining society and social club, essentially, or at most a kind of professional talking shop or association. But quite soon after the club was formed, an opportunity arose for the club members to collaborate on a mystery. In its very early days, um, half a dozen of the members, including Agatha Christie, were signed up by the BBC to record a a radio serial. They each wrote an instalment and read it out live. And a competition was run alongside it, and that was a huge success. That was a story called Behind the Screen. And if you read it now, it's, it's not the best detective story, but, but it was enormously popular. And they were then asked to write a, a second. This was called The Scoop, and that, that was a good detective story. Dorothy L. Sayers took the lead with that. Again, it was listened to by many millions, the sort of audience that today the BBC or any other broadcaster would kill for. Readers and listeners seem to really enjoy these whodunits that were written in collaboration by a group of their favourite writers. And of course, it was all excellent publicity for the club and for the individual authors. So much so, in fact, that the Detection Club decided to take control of the whole process. They decided to abandon the BBC and produce a novel of their own, a collaborative novel. 
and this was called the Floating Admiral. And that was compiled by 13 of the members. They each wrote a chapter in turn. And Anthony Barclay wrote the final chapter when he had to solve the mystery, pull all the strands together. It's a very long chapter and uh, it's called Clearing Up the Mess. There was another reason beyond pure artistic fulfilment that Dorothy L. Sayers and others put their time and effort into the floating admiral. Money. The detection club wanted a room of its own, and that required club funds. The proceeds from sales of that book and its follow-up, Ask a Policeman, enabled the members to rent two rooms at 31 Gerrard Street in Soho, right in the heart of what was then London's red light district. Members gathered often, enjoying the local bars and restaurants before staggering back to their clubhouse to debate methods of murder over a nightcap. I think whenever I've imagined the detection club's heyday, it's this time in the early 1930s that I've thought of, when the popularity of the Golden Age style was high and these collaborative books were paying for its foremost practitioners to have a good time. The question is, though, how long could it last? And after the break, we'll find out. This episode of She Done It is sponsored by BetterHelp, a service that makes professional counselling available securely online so that anyone who wants to tackle obstacles in their life or make a positive change can access the help that they want. A lot of us aren't exactly working a conventional 9-to-5 right now, and BetterHelp makes it really easy to get access to a licensed therapist in a way that suits you. After assessing your needs, they'll match you with a counsellor, and from there you can message them whenever you want, as well as scheduling weekly video or phone sessions. It's all very quick and easy. You can be in touch with someone within 48 hours. There are lots of things I like about this option. It's available worldwide. There's a wide range of expertise available. It's more affordable than traditional offline counselling. And there's also financial aid available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. And you can check it out further by reading their testimonials at betterhelp.com reviews. And if you visit betterhelp.com slash shedoneit, that's betterhelp.com slash shedoneit, you can join over a million people who are taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. So go to betterhelp.com slash shedoneit for 10% off your first month. This episode is also sponsored by Care Of, the personalised vitamin service designed to fit your life and body. They have an in-depth five-minute online quiz that you take. It's really easy and has a very friendly, cheerful interface, I thought. It asks you about things like how much sleep you get and what your health priorities are, and then it recommends a lineup of vitamins and supplements to suit you. It's all very straightforward. Best of all, Careof is extremely transparent about the research that goes into all of their choices. So you can check out their website and social media for all of those details and feel confident it's all evidence-based. Careof makes taking your vitamins really easy with your recommendations coming in daily, individually wrapped packets that are perfect for getting back into a routine. For 50% off your first Careof order, go to takecareof.com and enter code SHEDONEIT50. That's takecareof.com and code SHEDONEIT50 for 50% off your first order. Inevitably, the golden age of detective fiction couldn't last forever. I haven't actually talked much about this on the podcast so far, focusing instead on how the period in the style came into being rather than how it fizzled out. But if there's anyone who's qualified to explain this to us, it's Martin. And he says that just as the First World War had a great influence on how things got started, so did the Second World War help bring it to a close. The Second World War did change everything. And of course, one of the things it did was that the books that had previously been enormously fashionable were no longer of such interest, much less appeal to the critics who were looking at the new writers like Patricia Highsmith uh, and Julian Simmons and others. And therefore perhaps of less interest to the publishers. So there were a number of Golden Age typewriters, not least in the United States, who simply couldn't get their books published at all. Christie, of course, is an exception to every rule. And Naya Marsh was high profile and, and very successful. But the Golden Age, although books of that type continued to be written, and of course still continue to be written in one way or another, the Golden Age as a period of burning intensity and innovation seems to me to have come to an end with the war. The war changed lives all over the world and the Detection Club members were no exception. The Detection Club 
really continued to flourish until the Second World War. And in fact, by that time, Agatha Christie, who wasn't one of life's great um, joiners, was actually on the committee. So that shows you just how interested and enthusiastic she was. And then, of course, the war came, the club couldn't meet, the minutes were apparently lost in the Blitz, and um, there was some suggestion, John Dixon Carr at one point told Ellery Queen that the club had ceased to exist, but it, it hadn't. But it came back in the late 40s from about 46 onwards. But of course, the founder members, small percentage had died, others had lost their enthusiasm, such as Barclay and Sayat. So more members were brought in. As Martin says, the war also marked a shift in the careers of two of the most enthusiastic original members, Anthony Barclay and Dorothy L. Sayers. Neither published any crime fiction after 1939, although Barclay did keep up his journalism, and Sayers, of course, devoted herself to plays, religious writing and translation work. For them, perhaps, the Detection Club had served its purpose. But there were still crime writers. So what role could it play in their work? The club as a whole had a lower profile for a long time and and it really continued, although books were very occasionally published, it really continued to fly below the radar and operate just as a social club. But Agatha Christie took over as president after Sayers died in the late 50s and she remained president until her death and, uh, and was a very loyal adherent of the club. After her, there was Julian Simmons and after him, uh, Harry Keating. So it remained a club which stuck to the basic idea of uh, members by election and a relatively small membership because after all, it's a dining club. The club's fortunes were very closely tied to the style of writing that its founding members had stood for. And so as the public's interest turned away from intricate puzzle-based whodunits and towards more psychological stories, police procedurals and the like, the club, too, fell out of the spotlight somewhat. In an attempt to recognise the changing times, the ban on thriller writers joining was lifted in the 1950s. I was really keen to hear from Martin about his own experience with the Detection Club. After all, it's not exactly something that you can apply to join. So how does a contemporary crime writer get to be a member and eventually president? Well, I was invited as a guest a a very long time ago by um, Robert Barnard, who's a very good friend of mine, uh, one of those older writers who was to some extent a a mentor uh, and someone who gave me a lot of encouragement, helped me to get early short stories published and things like that. And he invited me along to the Savoy. That was was in the 90s. And then... um, Somewhat out of the blue, as these things ha- happen, I, I, I got a letter when I got home from work one day from Simon Brett, the president, telling me I'd, I'd been elected. At the first I was aware of it, of course. And so that was in 2008, and I was um, elected and uh, inducted on the same night as um, another good friend of mine, Anne Cleve. So, um, so we joined together and um, have been members ever since. The initiation ceremony dreamed up by the early members, in which the candidate had to swear an oath on Eric the Skull to uphold the principles of the club, is apparently still in use too. Well, the initiation ceremony was dreamed up in 1931, mainly by Sayers, but with input from Barclay and Ronald Knox and one or two others, I think. But it's, it's been adapted over the years and there have been various different versions of it. So the version that is used today is much shorter and crisper because um, ultimately the reality is that um, you have a nice long dinner and uh, the initiation ceremony comes at the end of the dinner. <laughs> Don't want it to go on for hours, hours, hours. So it's, so it's relatively brief, but it's still part of the tradition of the club. There are some pictures from the modern swearing-in ceremony on Martin's website, which I will link to in the show notes. I highly recommend taking a look. Martin, I should explain, has been publishing crime novels and short stories since the early 1990s, alongside his work as a solicitor. He's also worked very hard on promoting the genre. Many of the British Library crime classic editions that you might have read are edited by him. And he's also worked on lots of anthologies of short stories. Many of his own books are set in the modern day. But his two recent novels, Gallows Court and Mortmain Hall, are set in the Golden Age period. And the latter even includes a clue finder 
a fair play device almost certainly not seen in any mystery novel since the heyday of the Detection Club in the 1930s. My own introduction to his work, though, was through The Golden Age of Murder, his non-fiction book about the founding of the Detection Club and the stories that surround its original members. There's a huge amount of original research in that book, and details about detective fiction in the 1920s and 30s that you will struggle to find anywhere else. He was able to include some of that information because of his role as the Detection Club's archivist, a position he was given in 2011. As far as I can make out, he grabbed at the chance to amass Golden Age history and has barely looked back. The history to this is that probably about 15 years ago, knowing of my interest in the history of crime fiction, even in those days, the Crime Rights Association asked me to be their archivist. They had kept material from the 1950s. At that time, I was working full time, so I wasn't able to do very much with it. But uh, coincidentally, a few years later, Simon Brett, as president, asked me to do something with the archives of the Detection Club. But uh, the difference was the Detection Club had no archives. There's nothing there. So, so the task was rather different. It was to try to assemble material. And so I've gone around trying to pick up bits and pieces where I can, and information about the early members as well. So the archives of the Detection Club are much uh, less thorough than those of the Crime Rights Association, which are quite substantial. But I've been trying to add to them. And for instance, I've added to them uh, Bob Barnard's archive, quite a bit of his material is now part of it. And he, he was a, not only an interesting writer and an interesting person, but he, he kept everything. So there's some meat there uh, that I think is interesting to study. And I, I reached an agreement with Gladstone's Library in North Wales, um, founded by Gladstone towards the end of the uh, 19th century. And they agreed to take the archives on loan and to catalogue them and look after them. So that was a real breakthrough. And in the last few years, not this year, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it's had to be postponed until next year. But for the last few years, we've had a weekend in June called Alibis in the Archive, where writers have given talks. Members of the public have not only been able to come along and indeed stay, because you can stay in the library. It's got got, uh, very nicely appointed rooms, great place to stay. You can also have a look at uh, at some of the material. This is a, a long-term project, and it's certainly one that will far outlast me. I've got no doubt about that. But I think that, as with any uh, major project, you've got to start somewhere. And although in a, a low-key way, I feel that it was right to try to stockpile and preserve material where possible and make it accessible to people so that people can uh, see it for themselves it's not locked away in some dusty basement all the time and so my my hope is that as interest in the heritage of crime fiction develops so interest in the archives will increase the modern day detection club is also still publishing collaborative novels In 2016, along with other members of the club, Martin wrote The Sinking Admiral, the title being a nod to the original club round-robin work. Well, we did um, a modern homage to it called The Sinking Admiral that Simon Brett uh, masterminded. And I I, I wrote one chapter of that. But um, uh, when we'd written most of it, he organised a dinner, which was called the Whodunit Dinner, when uh, we all sat around the table and... um, figured out who the merger would be and selected the unfortunate uh, person who'd write the final chapter, which thankfully wasn't me. It didn't work quite the same way, though. Unlike in The Floating Admiral, where each chapter was written and signed by a different author, in The Sinking Admiral, you have to work it out for yourself. That was a little game so that uh, the challenge to the reader is to see if you can figure out who wrote who wrote which. The Detection Club does non-fiction, too. In 1936, they published a book called The Anatomy of Murder, which features essays by Sayers, Barclay, Freeman Wills Crofts and others about real-life murder cases. And later this year, 
an anthology of writing by members past and present will appear under the title of How Done It. This book called How Done It, and that's the Detection Club's new book about mm. the art and craft of crime writing. And it, it's predominantly uh, present day members, but there are also 20 odd members from the past uh, with their thoughts on different aspects of the process. And uh, that's something that um, was, was great fun to put together. Uh, it was it was quite quite a demanding job as it turned out because uh, I, I I envisaged fifteen or twenty pieces really rather than ninety but um, but it, it was worth it because it is it is a book I found really interesting to work on. The focus on craft is apt, I think given how much the Detection Club has always been about writers and the writing life. Although, regrettably, some of the early club papers and records have been lost, what remains still constitutes a fascinating record of a group that has gathered down the decades in honour of an enduring literary art form, the detective novel. Some things change, the people, for one thing, and the premises. No more sleazily glamorous Soho clubhouse. But other things remain the same. The writers who are devoted to this form are still gathering to experiment, collaborate and commiserate with each other. And Eric the Skull, of course. He never changes. This episode of She Done It was written, narrated and edited by me, Caroline Crampton. You can find show notes and links to Martin Edwards' books at shedoneitshow.com slash detectionclub, where there will also be further reading suggestions on the topics I covered today. I provide transcripts for every episode of the podcast too. Find them at shedoneitshow.com slash transcripts. If you become a paying supporter of the podcast, you get early access to every episode with no advertising, as well as the chance to join the excellent She Done It book club community. You can join now at shedoneitbookclub.com slash join. I'll be back on the 2nd of September with another episode. 